Hello, and welcome to lecture 13, where we're going to talk about inductors and RL circuits. In this lecture, we're really going to get into what inductance means and introduce our last circuit element to really conclude our running discussion on circuits. There's a lot of lectures that have previously covered circuits. Make sure you watch those because I will be referring to things like resistors and capacitors in this lecture. Well, let's get started. Our objectives are to understand that any real circuit, when first closed, so like when it's turned on, will induce an EMF due to the initial change in current, because we know a changing current creates a changing magnetic field, and a changing magnetic field induces a secondary current. We've seen this with Faraday's law and motional EMF. And we want to realize that this EMF will always oppose the EMF of the power source as consistent with Lenz's law. Indeed. We want to learn the units of inductance and the meaning of an inductor, that aforementioned circuit element. We want to familiarize yourself or ourselves with the inductor as a new circuit element that joins the other common circuit elements and be combined to make something called RL circuits. That's resistor inductor circuit, because L is the letter we use for inductance. Okay? We want to understand that RL circuits are DC circuits with time dependent behavior similar to RC circuits. All right? So there are definitely a lot of similarities there between. RL circuits and RC circuits, because they're both connected to batteries, which is a DC power source. Okay. Finally, we want to see that inductors store potential energy like a capacitor, but that that potential energy cannot create current from charges at rest. Because once that inductor is charged up, it can't just start currents moving if those currents are at rest, because a current at rest isn't going to feel or experience any force through the magnetic field because we aren't talking about magnetic fields after all, because we're talking about inductance, okay? Electromagnetic inductance. Now, I do want to add one last thing since the term DC came up. This is our final lecture on the topic of DC circuits. After this lecture, we're going to move on to AC circuits, which is alternating current, okay? All right, well, let's look at our first key term, self-inductance. What is it? Well, self-inductance is a property of circuits that makes them initially resist changes in current, okay? So circuits inherently resist change, okay? Well, what does that mean in practical matters? Well, it's an application of Faraday and Lenz's law. So absolutely refer to lecture 11 for Faraday and Lenz's law, okay? Now, let's look at this picture here, this diagram I have. So if you zoom in on this a bit, we can notice that a steady current creates a steady magnetic field, okay? This is a solenoid, there's a magnetic field, it's strong inside the coil, very weak outside the coil. We've seen these ideas when we first introduced how magnetic fields are created by moving charges. Okay, but that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about when the current is either increasing or decreasing because changing currents create changing magnetic fields that induce an EMF, all right, that opposes the change in current. So if the current is increasing, we have the Lenz's law EMF. This is the induced EMF. And notice that the induced EMF opposes the current direction of current because it's increasing. It doesn't want the current to increase. So it's opposing it, slowing down the increase, because the battery in this direction would try to make current flow in this direction. This would be the induced current direction. Okay? So that's opposing the increase. Now, you might wonder, why do we even refer to it as an EMF? Why don't we say it's an induced current? Well, there's some reasons for that, just due to the, the very idea of what's happening here in terms of the fact that the changing magnetic field is, in, is creating an electric field. The electric field over distance is the voltage, after all. So it, it's, it's, kind of, it's the better, more fundamental term to refer to, and it is also the convention. Okay, but as far as opposing change, I'll cover the next one here. When the current is decreasing, well, if the current is decreasing, the induced EMF wants to keep the current going. So it's going to try and encourage, encourage the current to flow in the direction it's been flowing to offset the decrease. Okay, so we've seen this idea. This is the same language I use when I introduce Lenz's law, all about opposing change. The only difference is that now we're calling it an induced EMF. Okay. And it's the self-inductance, because just the very act of having this coil in the circuit makes it have an inherent self-inductive application, okay? Now, 
all circuit elements, including wires themselves, any resistor, batteries, they're all gonna have some self-inductance, but it'd be very hard to quantify that self-inductance. So the only type that we're gonna seriously consider and use equations to quantify are gonna be that of coils and solenoids, all right? Okay, so a coil or a solenoid that has a self-inductance that we're going to quantify is called, you guessed it, an inductor. Right? That's the term for a coil or solenoid when we put it in a circuit, which we'll see plenty of examples of in just a few moments. Okay, So it's called an inductor. It is the last basic circuit element. Okay, It's represented as a coil-like shape like this. Right, So then you could put it in a circuit and you put it next to a resistor. So you'd have L and R. All right? It represents a coil or solenoid. Notice I'm using the term coil or solenoid. That's because we're not differentiating bet between the two. We'll have one formula to refer to how to talk about the inductive uh, capabilities of a coil slash solenoid. We don't say, oh, well, if it's particularly long and very narrow, we're considered a solenoid. No, we just have one formula here. That is in contrast to when we talked about the magnetic field that was composed by coils that are wider than they're long and solenoids that are longer than they are wide. Okay? So no such differentiation here. We just have one inductor. Okay. All right. Zoom out a tad here. Inductors have time-dependent behavior for circuits that have changing current. Okay. Now we're, we're, I'm going to be unpacking that. What do I mean by time-dependent behavior? Well, you'll see. Okay. So hold that thought. The quantity of inductors is inductance, just like the quantity of resistors is resistance. Okay. Or the quantity of capacitors is capacitance. Okay. So it's the same, same idea. So it's inductance. In inductance is a derived unit. It's represented by uppercase L. Okay. The name of that unit is the Henry. Okay. So the, the variable is L. The variable is L. The unit is the Henry represented by H. Okay. So we have a variable L. We have a unit uppercase H. It's a lot to keep track of, right? And we have dimensions of mass, length squared, time to the negative two, and current to the negative two. Okay. So there you have it, a brand new unit, Henry, the unit of inductance, named after American physicist, Henry, okay? And it's determined, inductance is determined by the physical parameters of the inductor. That should also sound really similar. Think about how we determined um, resistance. We need to know the resistivity of the material, how wide the wire was and how long the wire was. Think about how we determined capacitance. We need to know the size of the plates, the gap between the plates and whether there was a dielectric. Those were all, physical parameters. Same idea here, okay? And you'll see the formula. We'll need to know how long the coil is, how wide the coil is, okay? All right, so that's an inductor and the property of inductors, inductance. Now, let's talk about RL circuits, okay? So an RL circuit is a circuit with a DC voltage, so a battery, a switch, a resistor, and an inductor. It's this right here, okay? There's a switch. We can close that switch. Here's a battery, okay? We're gonna rep represent the battery uh, of, or the voltage of the battery using the curly E or the script E, just to easily differentiate, visually differentiate it from the voltage across the inductor itself. So it's, you know, we could we could call this, you know, V bat for voltage of the battery, but I'm always gonna use the letter script E for the voltage of the battery. Here is the inductor and here is the resistor, okay? They are absolutely there in series, they'll always be in series. And this is the circuit we're talking about every time we talk about an RL circuit for this lecture and for this class, okay? And we will only concern ourselves with the switch closing. So when the current first starts flowing, that is, that is the time-dependent situation that we will tackle and discuss, okay? So like an RC circuit, an RL circuit has time-dependent current when the switch is first closed with, be with behavior set by the time constant, okay? So that should all sound very, very familiar. RC circuits, they exponentially decayed in terms of the current in the circuit. The voltage across the capacitor exponentially approached a, a constant value, right, as the capacitor became fully charged and, and that voltage across the capacitor opposed the voltage of the battery. So that type of exponential behavior, that's what we mean. That's why I say it's similar, okay? And another similarity is inductors store potential energy, okay? In the objectives above, I mentioned there's a key difference between that, that type of, what that stored energy can do really, but there, again, similarity-wise, the stored energy is a similarity between RL circuits 
and RC circuits. So it is important to see that there is there is a lot of that lot a lot to compare, but there are some important differences. Okay, unlike an RC circuit, the inductor acts as an open switch at first, and over time allows more current to flow until it just acts like a wire. Now, if you recall, and you can go back and review our lecture on RC circuits, an RC circuit is the exact opposite. RC is the opposite. When you first close the switch on a circuit that just has a resistor, a capacitor, and a battery, well, in that, at first, the current flows as if there's nothing there. It's only as the capacitor becomes charged that then the current decays to zero. The fully charged capacitor stops the current. But see, the inductor is the opposite because the inductor has a self-inductance that, that opposes change. And when is the change the greatest? When the switch is first closed. So when the switch is first closed, the self-inductance is so great that no current can flow. It's only gradually, exponentially over time that current is able to flow. Okay, so that is an RL circuit, and we'll put them to practice in our examples in just a moment. But let's cover our key equations. Our first three key equations are all about definitions, and we'll have some example problems to get practice with these definitions, but let's define all the variables. Okay, so this first equation is a proportionality law that defines inductance. It is a proportionality law, which is a term that refers to these basic laws, like Ohm's law, because Ohm's law was a basic proportionality law between voltage, current, and resistance. Here, we have a basic proportionality law between voltage, inductance, and change in current, okay? So this is the induced EMF. This is the negative sign, because do notice it's there, that represents the opposing induced EMF. This is just a manifestation of Lenz's law. 99% of the time, we won't actually use the negative sign in our quantitative computations. Instead, if we need to know the direction, we'll just employ Lenz's law and know that the induced EMF must oppose the change, okay? L is the inductance, units of Henry's, okay? And our delta I over delta T is the rate of change in current. It's amps per second. Okay, and again, the change in current is greatest when the switch is first closed, and then that rate of change of current gradually declines, okay? Until there's no current flowing at all, which means it's not changing, once the inductor has its full amount of potential energy stored in it and has completely stopped the flow of current, okay? So this is a good starting definition of inductance, but it's not the only way we can think about inductance because this next equation also does a good job and this equation comes from combining Faraday's law with the definition of inductance above, okay? And that allows us to relate inductance to the magnetic flux and the current. And if you recall, Faraday's law said that the change in magnetic current over the change in time is the induced EMF, okay? Well, then by combining that definition of induced EMF with this equation over here, we cancel out the delta T and we get the following relationship that tells us that inductance is equal to the number of coils. This is the first time the number of coils show up because it does matter. L larger solenoids will have larger values of inductance, but then we have these actual changing values, the change in magnetic flux in the numerator and the change in current in the denominator, okay? So number of coils n, all right? And an interesting thing we can do with this equation is we can simplify. And this is a, a wonderful simplification. And it's because the change in flux per the change in current is linear. So we can actually replace this slope because, of course, that's what it represents. If I was to look at this graph over here, this slope is rise over run, right, which is the change in magnetic flux over the change in current. But since the slope is exactly linear, it never varies. So we can actually replace it with the instantaneous values. Okay, so we don't need to know the change in flux or the change in current. We just need to know the flux and or the current, depending on what we're solving for, at a particular moment in time. Okay, so linearity comes to the rescue here. Okay, and just to be clear, our uppercase phi with the subscript B is magnetic flux measured in Weber's, a rather recent unit we just used, okay, and or just learned, and current for I measured in amps. Okay, 
So there we have kind of two ways to define inductance. All right, you know, they're, they're interrelated, but practically speaking, these are two ways we might tackle and approach inductance. This last formula is distinct. It's how we actually build an inductor, okay? So this is inductance determined by the physical parameters of the coil solenoid, okay? And what's it based on? Well, it's based on the cross-sectional area of the coil so solenoid in square meters, on the length of the coil or solenoid in meters, and we have just a physical constant here, the permeability constant, which shouldn't be a big surprise because we are talking about magnetic fields here. Permeability is so associated with magnetic fields, just like permittivity is associated with electric fields. Okay, but this is the inductance for a particular size and length coil with a particular number, this is the same end, of coils. Okay, all right. Now let's move on to RL circuits because our next set of equations covers RL circuits. Okay, and I have a graph here. I have a graph of two things versus time, okay? So our vertical axis is serving double purpose here. It represents current as a function of time and voltage across the inductor. Notice the subscript L. So this is voltage across the inductor also as a function of time, okay? And which is which? Well, let's see here. The blue line is the current, okay? This is the current across the inductor because at first, there's no current. When the switch is first closed, okay, this is the moment that the switch is closed. So switch is closed at t equals zero seconds. That's always going to be the case, okay? Whenever, whenever, op whenever you know, opening switches for these RL circuits, we're only closing the switch. And at very first, that inductor acts as a, as a complete block, right? It, it, it's acting like an open switch at that very first moment. And only over time does it allow current to flow. Eventually, it allows current to flow up into the maximum current, I max, okay? And I max is none other than E over R. Why E over R? From Ohm's law. This is just the EMF of the battery over the resistance of the circuit, okay? So it is approaching that final value. On the other hand, voltage is exponentially decaying because the initial voltage across the inductor right here is equal to the voltage of the battery, see? because it has to be, because that, that's the only way it can prevent any flow of current. But over time, the voltage across the inductor decays down until the inductor might as well not be there, just might as well be any wire. And that's, that's what we see here, okay? Now, both of these equations, these exponential equations, which you should see some similarities to the RC exponential equations, have a tau, and that tau is the time constant. The time constant here is defined by R and L, which you see right below, all right? Now let's label everything. Okay, so V sub L is the voltage across the inductor, as I said, all right? Then I is the current through the circuit, which would also be the current through the inductor because they all share a current since this is a series circuit, all right? E or um, is, well, I max is E over R, all right? Just from Ohm's law. And then E is the battery voltage. And then tau is the time constant, units of seconds, it's just a time, okay? And the time constant is defined as L over R, okay? Inductance over resistance, all right? So you can see right there that, you know, it's a, we, there's so many ways to look at the units here, so many inter, interconnected units, because we could say that, that a Henry is an ohm second, which it is, okay? All right, and finally, regarding the stored energy in an inductor, we've got this last equation. This is the potential energy stored in an inductor. The form is one half Li squared. This should look similar to the, the type of stored energy in a capacitor. Okay, similar form here. And a good way to think about the stored energy because it's not, it's not as obvious as a stored energy capacitor where you, you obviously have positive charges on one end, negative charges on the other end. They want, they want to come together and holding them apart takes energy. So, so pull, building them up on those opposite plates, of course, is storing energy, just like lifting something above the ground is a form of storing energy. So how do you store energy in a magnetic field? Well, what I've described here is I said the potential energy stored in an inductor is equal to the work the battery does to move the charges across the induced EMF. Since the battery had to do work to move those charges, even though the induced EMF wanted to prevent the charges from moving, that meant that energy had to go somewhere and that energy gets stored in the magnetic field. Okay, all right, let's get on to our practice problems. We have three types, type one, these are fairly simple problems that involve calculating the inductance and self-inductance EMF of solenoids. They're gonna use the definitions. Then type two, problems that involve RL circuits 
and working with the time constant, instantaneous current, and instantaneous vol voltage within that circuit. Okay, that's all the exponential functions. Type three, problems that involve the potential energy in inductors, including the instantaneous value of potential energy before the current reaches its final value. Okay, all right, let's start with the concept question. Make sure we're good on this idea of Lenz's law being another way to look at self-inductance. Question one, the diagram shows an inductor that is part of a circuit. Okay, we don't care about the rest of the circuit, but it is. The direction of the EMF induced in the inductor is indicated. This is the induced EMF. What are two possible types of current that could create this induced EMF? Pause the video if you need to, because I want you to have an idea. What induced or what change in current could induce this EMF? Okay, because a constant current certainly wouldn't. Okay, all right, here are the answers. If the current is flowing from right to left and increasing, because this induced EMF would oppose that increase to the left. See it? Okay, because there would be a positive terminal on the induced EMF that's trying to flow current this way. This is the induced current opposing the original current increasing. Okay, or what's the other way? All right, if it's flowing to the right, from the left to the right, but decreasing, because in that case, the induced EMF would be trying to assist in the decrease, trying to get the current back to where it was. Okay? All right, so those are the two cases that will result in this direction of induced EMF. All right, now let's run some numbers. Example one, what is the self-inductance in a coil that experiences a 2.3 volt induced EMF when the current is changing at a rate of 160 amps per second? Okay, so this comes down to definitions. Here is the definition we're gonna use here, definition of inductance. We're gonna solve for inductance, so just do some algebra, okay, cross multiply. All right, plug in our values because we got our 2.3 volts and we have a rate of change of current. And that gives us an inductance of 1.44 times 10 to the negative 2 henrys. Excellent. Okay, part B. If the coil has 125 turns, then what is the magnetic flux through each turn at the moment that the moment that the current is 5.4 amps? At the moment that the current is 5.4 amps is what it should say. Okay. Okay, so let's see. So from this definition, so consider or relating inductance to number of coils, magnetic field, and current, and notice I'm looking at instantaneous magnetic field, instantaneous current, I can go ahead and solve for the magnetic field. Now I know this is going to be mag the magnetic field through each turn, so through each loop, because I've divided by n. Okay, so I'm not getting the total magnetic flux, I'm getting magnetic flux per turn. Okay, and so then I just plug in my values. Now I'm gonna use the inductance that I solved for in part A. I'm gonna use my current value that I was told in part B, and then just divide by the number of turns. And there I have a value of 6.21 times 10 to the negative four Webers is the magnetic flux through one coil, one turn of the coil at this moment in time. Okay, very good. All right, on to example two. A toroidal solenoid, I'll draw a picture of what that is, has a mean radius of 12 centimeters and a cross-sectional area of 0.6 square centimeters. Okay, how many turns does a solenoid have if its inductance is 0.1 millihenries? Okay, so a toroidal solenoid is taking a solenoid, and instead of leaving it as a rectangle, curling it back in on itself. So turning it into a torus, which is like a donut, okay? So we have our big radius is 0.12 meters, and the cross-sectional area of each of like kind of the donut part is 6 times 10 to the negative 5 square meters. And that was just a matter of converting this from square centimeters to square meters, okay? Now I could find the small radius, I could call this little r, but it's not needed for the problem, okay? And the overall length of the solenoid would just be 2 pi r because it's the circumference of the torus of the donut, okay? And of course, L comes up in the formula for calculating inductance, okay? Now we know inductance in this case, so we're not solving for inductance, instead we're solving for number of coils. Okay, there is our inductance value written in the scientific notation. And here's our formula, inductance based on physical parameters. Now what am I gonna solve for? Yep, I'm gonna solve for N, okay? So all I've done here is isolate N and solve for it. I know L, big L that is, inductance. I know little L, because the circumference of the torus. I know cross-sectional area and permeability. So I plug in my values and I get exactly a thousand turns. Okay, so this coil has to have a thousand loops or a thousand turns. Okay, 
Now, in part B, I say, if the current in the solenoid is changing at a rate of 1.02 amps per second, then what is the induced EMF in the inductor? Well, this one's dead easy, but I just wanted to get more practice with the formulas. We simply go back to the definition and literally plug them right in. We know inductance and we know our rate of change, so we're good to go. And we have an induced EMF of 1.02 times 10 to the negative four volts. All right, okay, now let's build a solenoid, okay? So if you want to design a solenoid inductor that sets the rate of current change at 1.31 amps per second, okay, I was kind of cut off, but this is 1.31 amps per second, when attached to a 12 millivolt battery, I'm going to make some changes to values here, that's why it looks like it's written in by hand, okay, so a 12 millivolt battery, and fits in a space of 2 millimeters by 0.4 millimeters, okay, so that's like kind of how you have to fit it in, that's obviously going to determine the length and the diameter or the radius of the solenoid, then how many coils will you need? Okay. All right, so we set the inductance from the uh, definition equal to the inductance from the parameters. Okay, so what we're doing here is we're just going to say, okay, well, we know that inductance is equal to, so L, you know, by is equal to EMF times delta I over delta T, okay? All right, so I'm just gonna set, set that over here, or I'm sorry, E is equal to L times delta I over delta T. So I can then solve for L, so that's what I've done here. And then we also know that L is equal to this. So all I've done is just set these two different forms of inductance equal to each other, okay? And I know that A, the cross-sectional area, is pi R squared, okay? And R is half of the width, okay? Because this, this effectively is the diameter, D, okay? So there we have our value for the radius. And our L is just two millimeters. So this is just two millimeters, and this is half of 0.4 millimeter, 0.4 millimeters. So now with that information, I'm gonna solve for N just like I did in the problem above, okay? But here it's based on more information because I was, I was told the rate of change of the current as well as the battery voltage, okay? And plug in all our values, and we end up with 3,410 turns. Okay, so if we wanted to build an inductor to serve this particular purpose of controlling the current current rate change at that at that rate, and we had to fit it in this space, then we better uh, make it out of really really thin wire because we got to fit a lot of turns in there. Now, of course, there's actual downside to the design because if you do need to fit that many turns in such a small space, then you need a really really thin wire. And you remember what happens when you have really really thin wires, really high resistance. So it's a trade off. Okay. All right. So example four, moving on to RL circuits. Enough of the definitions, let's work with these time-dependent circuits. Okay, so a series circuit contains a 12-volt battery, a 3.3 ohm resistor, and a 4.4 millihenry inductor. If the switch to the battery is closed at t equals zero, find the time required for the current in the circuit to reach 63% of its final value. Okay, so 63%, why does that sound familiar? Hmm. So using the current equation for RL circuits, which is the following, okay, this is the time-dependent equation we're all, we always use for current for RL circuits, let's go ahead and solve for T, okay? So first of all, we're going to acknowledge that our instantaneous value of current is stipulated as being 0.63 times I final, and I final is just going to equal E over R, okay? Because, right, because it's just going to be the current over the resistance, okay? Okay? Because after a while, remember, the current is flowing freely. So the, fi the final state of our RL circuit is just the current flowing without, without any inductor effectively being there. That's why the final current is just equal to battery voltage over resistance, okay? So now we have our next equation here. All I've done is plug that in. So I just replaced the instantaneous current with 0.63 times E over R, the final voltage, and then E over R is right here, so they cancel out, okay? So then I can rewrite this as, well, by just doing some algebra, you know, basically moving, moving E to this side, okay? Then I just have E to the negative T over tau, the time constant tau, is equal to one minus 0.63, okay? And then I'm gonna take the natural log of both sides, which of course will undo the function of the exponential, so then I just have negative t over tau equals the natural log of 0.37. Ah, okay, but if I then remember my laws of logarithms, okay, then I know if I have a negative here, 
because I, you know, I multiply by the negative. Well, the negative outside a logarithm is the same as a negative one exponent inside the logarithm. Okay, now definitely review your laws of logarithms. Not that we need that all the time because you can just plug it into a calculator, but here it shows a neat fact. So what I've done, again, I've taken the negative because I, from multiplication and isolating my value of t, right? But then I took my negative one inside and 0 0.37 to the negative one power is just one over 0 0.37, see? Okay, and then of course I cross multiplied by the time constant tau, so it's in front of the natural log. So then one over 0 0.37 is just 2.7. So now I have the natural log of 2.7. Well, here's the thing. I'm dealing with two sig figs, and it turns out that to the limit of this significant figures of this problem, 2.7 is exactly equal to E. And the natural log of E is just one. So that means that my time is tau. And that means that I already knew the answer, and I didn't have to do all this work. Because I could have just recognized that 63%, again, to at least two within two sig figs, is exactly how long it takes to get to the final value. All right? So it's just the time constant tau. And I don't even show the calculation, but tau is, tau is just going to be r over l. Okay? So I just, just a matter of taking 3.3 .3 and dividing by 4.4. .4. All right? Let's see. Well, actually... It is L over R. I said it backwards. Tau is L over R. I recognize that. That can't be right. It's not it's an R over L. It's L over R. So it's the small value, 4.4 millihenries, divided by 3.3 ohms. Okay? And that gives us our rather short time, right? Just 1.33 milliseconds. Okay? But again, we could have foregone all this work. Okay? But it's still good practice because for any other value of time, we would need it. Okay? Or solving for any other particular time. This is how we undo the exponential. Okay, let's go on to another example. Example five, here we have a picture of our RL circuit. A sensitive electronic device of resistance 175 ohms is to be connected to a source of EMF of negligible internal resistance by a switch. The device is designed to op operate with a 36 milliamp current, but to avoid damage to the device, the current can rise no more than 4.9 milliamps in the first 58 milliseconds. So they don't, they don't want the current to jump up really quickly. They want the current to move up, you know, in a short amount of time, but not super fast to not damage the current or damage the circuit, okay? An inductor is therefore connected, and that's really one of the uses of inductors, in series with the device, as shown in the figure, okay? Part A, what is the required source EMF? Okay, so let's go back, think about what we're going to do here. So we know that the steady state final current, because again, after a while, it's like the inductor isn't there, okay? is just going to be 36 times 10 to the negative three amps, okay? Because that's what we're told, that's its operating current, okay? That's the maximum current, because at first the current is zero, okay? And by Ohm's law, just V equals IR, but here it's the EMF of the battery, we can then go ahead and plug in our final state current and our resistance and find that 6.3 volts is the battery. So that was just going back to just making sure we understood what was being asked because we didn't actually have to use any of the new equations, okay? Part B, what is the required inductance? Okay, so how do we how do we do that? Well, we again go back to definitions, but at least in this case is one of our new definitions. We're gonna go back to this definition of induced EMF and its relationship to inductance, what I often refer to as the definition of inductance. So it's just gonna be induced EMF divided by the change in current or the change in time. And now we're gonna put in the 6.3 volts, okay? That's the voltage across, you know, the maximum voltage across the inductor, okay? And then divided by our change in current. Our change in current here is going to be that many amps in that much time, okay? So we weren't given it as a rate. We were just given, the, you know, how long it took and how much current change it was. And it ends up being 74.6 henrys, so a rather large inductor, okay? And then we want to find the time constant. Well, time constant is L over R. And now that we know L, and we always knew R, then we can simply plug in our numbers, okay? Because we have here our 175 ohms is our resistance. Okay, so 74.6 henrys divided by 175 ohms, and it turns out our time constant is just under half a second, 0.426 seconds. Okay, all right, example six. A 21 volt battery is in a circuit with a 48 milliohm inductor and a 0.15 ohm resistor. The switch is closed at T equals zero. That's always gonna be the case. Find the time constant in the circuit, okay? 
Find the current after 225 milliseconds. Find the voltage drop across the resistor at T equals zero and at 225 milliseconds. And then finally, what is the rate of change of the current at 225 milliseconds? Okay. All right. So first, the time constant. All right. Well, we already know L and R, so this is quite easy. And there we go. 0.32 seconds. Okay. Now, I know it was easy, but I asked for it because it's good to be in the habit of if you have enough information to find the time constant, find it first. Okay. And so indeed, since we were explicitly asked for it, here is our time constant. Okay. Now, part B. At t equals 225 milliseconds, let's go ahead and find the current. Okay. Well, here's our formula. And here, we don't need to solve for t. We're going to plug in for t, which is easier, right? So here, we know that our voltage is 21.9 volts, okay? We know that our resistance is 0.15 ohms, okay? So that's all I've done here, all right? And we know that we're finding at a particular time, and we're dividing by tau. We already know tau, okay? So we know everything we need in order to find the current at any particular time. And at this, it turns out that at 225 milliseconds, we have 73.7 amps, okay? All right, a little bit less than one time constant to get to this this much current through the circuit. Okay. What now? The voltage. So find the voltage drop across the resistor when t equals zero and when t equals 225 milliseconds. Okay. So the voltage drop across the well, actually, I'm finding the voltage drop across the inductor. Okay. So the if we wanted to find the voltage drop across the resistor, we would simply need to use Kirchhoff's loop rule and just subtract it from the total voltage. So I'll go ahead and solve it because I solved the problem for finding the voltage drop across the induct inductor. And then I'll, I'll mention this because actually I, I answered a different question. Okay. So the voltage drop across the inductor at t equals zero is just going to be the voltage of the battery times e to the negative zero, which is just e. Okay. So that means if the voltage drop across the inductor is e, then how much voltage drop can there be across the resistor? Zero. Okay, so the voltage drop across the resistor at t equals zero is zero volts because there's no current flowing yet, There's no, which means there can be no voltage. You can't have voltage drop across, across the resistor if there's no current. You can have voltage drop across an inductor without current because that opposing EMF, okay? Okay. Now, what about at 225 milliseconds? Okay, so here I'm just saying it's equal to 21.9, okay? Now, what about the voltage drop across the inductor at that later time, 225 milliseconds? Simply a matter of plugging into the equation, our exponential decay of voltage across the inductor, plug in our time, plug in our EMF, and we get 10.8, okay? Well, 10.8, then the voltage drop across the resistor is just gonna be 21.9 minus 10.8, okay? And again, that just comes from Kir Kirchhoff's loop rule, okay? All right. All right, and finally, in part D, what is the rate of change of the current at that time? Okay, well, now it's simply a matter of taking the definition here. This is the definition of inductance, but instead of putting in the voltage of the battery, we're gonna put in the instantaneous voltage drop across the inductor, because that will give us an instantaneous rate of change. So we're taking this equation and using it for a new purpose, okay, a slightly different purpose. All right, and then it's just a matter of solving for that rate of change, which is gonna be the instantaneous voltage drop across the inductor divided by the inductance of the inductor, 10.8 uh, volts divided by 48 times 10 to the negative three Henry's, and we end up with 226 amps per second, okay? So you can see that the, the, the larger you wait, the longer you wait, the smaller the voltage, the voltage drop gets, which means the smaller the rate of change gets, all right? So over time, as T grows, the voltage goes down, therefore the change in current, the rate of change of current also goes down. Okay? All right, let's do our last two examples that involve storing energy in an inductor. Example seven. A 14 volt battery is connected in series with a switch, a five ohm resistor, and a coil. The time constant is 4.8 times 10 to the negative four seconds. What energy is, the store, is stored in the coil when the current is 2.7 amps? And there's no part B here, so really just call it A, or just call it the problem. Okay, so here is the equation for stored potential energy in the inductor, one half Li squared. All right, and here's our equation for the time constant, L over R. Okay, so now L then is just tau times R, okay? And so then we can find the inductance because we're given all the information we need to find it, okay? So then now that we have the inductance and we have the current at a particular moment, then simply a matter of plugging these two values in, then we can find the energy. All right, so we have one half times our solved for inductance value times the current squared. 
and we end up with 8.75 times 10 to the negative 3 joules of stored energy in our inductor at this particular moment, okay? Now, I didn't ask you how much time it took to get there, okay? I could have, but I didn't. Instead, since you're just given the rate of change, you didn't have to find the time, okay? Now, that's going to be in contrast to example eight, where it's necessary to find the time. So let's take a look at it. Number eight is a more complicated problem. A 135 volt DC power supply is connected in series with a 2.1 times 10 to the negative 3 ohm resistor and an inductor. Okay, we're not told about the inductance, so we're going to solve for it. If the voltage across the inductor is found to be 60 volts after 2.4 seconds, then what is the energy stored in the inductor when the rate of change of current is 30.4 amps per second? And again, I had to make a couple changes to the values here, which is why it's handwritten. And then when does this occur? And part C, the stored en energy is what percentage of the maximum potential energy of the inductor? Okay. So how do we start this out? We want to find the time constant for, from the given information. Okay, so I'm going to use my exponential decay of voltage across the inductor. And I'm just going to start solving for T. All right. Now, I'm actually, what I'm going to do here is I'm not going to solve for T because I know that I have, let's see. So we have a particular moment in time. Okay, so let's, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to solve for tau. Yes, tau after 2.4 seconds. So I'm going to use 2.4 as my value of little t, okay? And then I'm going to solve for tau, okay? See? All right, so I've just isolated tau, just did the did the math, you know, inverse, you know, basically, you know, um, undid the function with a natural log to get rid of the exponential, okay? And then I'm going to plug in my values, 2.4 seconds. I've got the voltage across the inductor, I'm told is 60 volts at that moment in time. And then I know that the battery voltage is 135 volts, right, specified right here. Okay, so when I plug everything in, I've got my time constant. Good, 2.96 seconds. So I'm practicing what I preach here. I'm saying that, okay, good thing to find right away if you can is the time constant. I've done, done so, okay? Now, since I'm trying to find stored energy, the time constant doesn't show up in the stored energy equation, obviously, right? There's no tau in this expression, but L is. So I'm gonna use tau to find L, okay? So this, get, um, this will give us the value of inductance by simply using this relationship since we know R. Okay, we know the resistance of the resistor. So if I find the inductance as tau times r, it's going to be my 2.96 seconds times 2.1 times 10 to the negative 3 ohms, which gives me 6.22 times 10 to the negative 3 henrys. Excellent. Okay. All right. And then finally, I'm going to plug that in to um, find the amount of stored energy. But first, I'm still missing something. Right? Because I'm like, okay, well, I, you know, I, okay. So I got the L now for stored energy. So that means I'll just plug it in. But what's I? Was I given I? Well, no, I wasn't given I. I was given a rate of change of current. I wasn't actually given the current. So how do I take a rate of change of current and get a current from it? Well, Kirchhoff's loop rule, okay? So check it out. We've got the voltage gain from the battery, we have a voltage drop across the resistor, and we have a voltage drop across the inductor. That voltage drop across the inductor is dependent on the rate of current change. And I know that. And now I even know the inductance. So that means I can solve for the one unknown in this equation, I. All right. So I isolate I. All right. I plug in everything I know. Since I know R, I already always knew the voltage of the battery. I, I found the inductance. All right. Okay. I found the inductance from, by finding the time constant. And there we go. Finally, we've got our current at that particular moment, 6.42 times 10 to the 4 amps. So a lot of current. Okay, finally, I can put this all together, my values of L and I into the equation for the stored potential energy inside the inductor, one half Li squared. Plug it all in, and there we go. We got about 12 million joules of stored energy. Very big inductor, okay? All right, excellent. Now I asked for when does this happen, all right? When does this occur? Now I might be thinking, like, doesn't it occur at, you know, 2.4 seconds? Well, no. I was told that there was 60 volts across the inductor at 2.4 seconds, but I was never told that this rate of current change corresponded to that voltage. And indeed it does not. So let's see, how long does it take until this rate of current change occurs, All right? Because again, the 60 volts in 2.4 seconds was only given in order to find tau and thus find L, okay? So now let's go on to part B. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to my expression for the exponential approach of current up to its final steady state, its final value, okay? And this is the current through the inductor, as well as the current through the whole circuit, okay? And now I'm just gonna go ahead and solve for T just by doing the whole process that we've seen a few times, all right? Finally, isolate T, plug in all my values, including the time constant I solve for above, and I get 19.4 seconds. Well, that's a lot of time, 
Well, especially, you know, considering that the time constant was only 2.96 seconds. That means there's many time constants to get there. That means that this, this circuit has been running for a while. And if the circuit's been running for a while, that means that the inductor must be nearly fully charged. Aha, uh -huh. well, that takes us to part C. The stored energy is what percentage of maximum potential energy of the inductor. All right. Now, saying the inductor is fully charged, I, I try not to, you know, I, I kind of say that because I'm used to saying, oh, capacitors charge up. We're talking about energy, so we're charging the inductor. But again, it's a little different, right? We're, instead, we're storing energy in the magnetic field. Okay. So there's nearly maximum stored energy in the magnetic field. And let's find out how much. Okay. So the maximum energy in the field is simply one half L times the final current, which is just the voltage of the battery divided by the resistor. Okay. So we could have found this with, we didn't, you know, the only thing we needed to solve for was L. So the final amount is 1.28 times 10 to the seven joules. Well, that's the same with to within three six significant figures of what we had before. So it really is nearly fully charged, but that's what we should expect, considering that this is this is equal to so many time constants, you know, because it's um you know it's at least six time constants. Okay, this is about you know six tau. Okay, and let's find exactly how much. So I'll just take the ratio of the stored potential energy in the inductor that I found up here over the maximum one, this one here. All right, multiply by 100 to get a percent. Here are my values. Again, it looks like I'm just going to get a value of one, but based on the significant figures that were saved in my calculator, I get 99.7. Okay, so it's not quite fully charged, but darn close. Okay, well, that concludes our lecture on introducing self inductance, the circuit element inductors, and how they function in a circuit with a single DC power source and a resistor. We will talk more about inductors when we talk about alternating current AC circuits, but that's an await for the very next lecture. I hope this lecture has been informative and interesting. Thank you so much for watching.